Incoming transmission. Can you hear us? Are we coming in clear? Can you see us? I don't think they can see us. Why can't they see us? Wait, shouldn't they be able to see us? Yeah, I think they should be able to see us. Oh my gosh, that's so much better. Oh, so that's what you look like. This is a whole observatory podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Welcome to Star Hello, this is Cody Half Moon. And I'm your co host, Haley Osborne. And today we will be talking about spectroscopy. And what is this? <laughs> so, uh, spectroscopy is uh, basically a technique to study light. And there's a bunch of different types of uh, light. So, there's a bunch of different types of spectroscopy. And uh, it's been used since the 1800s. So, it's a pretty old form I've also of science. The first spectroscopy. Spectroscopy tool. How do you say it? Spec. <laughs> uh, spectrographs. It Spectograph. Our first spectrograph being our eyeballs. Yeah. So um, it's been used to uh, do like a bunch of things. Uh, like we're talking um, astronomical observations. We've also used these in like MRIs to study the human brain, things like that. Really? Um, so like all the wavelengths of light. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So there's this whole thing called the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is every form that light could take. And so on that spectrum, there are radio waves, there's microwaves, infrared, uh, visible in uh, UV, uh, X-ray, and gamma rays. So these are all on like the same chart where colors are. So colors are all in that visible light range. Everything else is not able to be seen with the human eye. But okay. there are species on Earth that can see more than the human eye can see. So, for example, mantis shrimp, um, they, yeah. So um, the human eye has somewhere between like three and five color cone receptors inside of it. So right. that's what allows you to see color. Mantis shrimp have 17. So they can that like makes them really see creepy. UV and infrared. It's crazy. All the more reason to not go in the water, folks. I know, right? <laughs> and it's, it's really cool because like um, a lot of insects, like uh, especially like butterflies and bees, mm -hmm. they see primarily in ultraviolet light because flowers actually have ultraviolet patterns on them and so that pollinators can see them better and they can like just hunt down the flowers so they can go pollinate them so they're like they're seeing in the 70s they're like Ooh, <laughs> that's awesome i didn't know that dude okay. yeah it's really cool like uh okay. light is really cool i um i studied optics in college mostly like that was my me too but marketing <laughs> <laughs> totally different types of optics so the so the let me get this straight mm -hmm. just like basics yeah. and i'm asking this for the audience Obviously. It's for you guys, not for me. Um, so light hits things and bounces back and goes into our co cones. Mm -hmm. Cones? Corns. <laughs> Eye cones? So there's rods and cones. Rods mm, are what okay. allow you to see clearly. Okay. Cones are what allow you to see color. Gotcha. So it goes into our cones. Mm -hmm. For me, I like cones. <laughs> oh, my God. It bounce, so it's kind of – everything's kind of bouncing around. So that's why mm -hmm. it's on the same, um, like – why you have radio waves because they're also bouncing around. It's just radiation hitting us all the time, different waves hitting us all the time, and sometimes it's light seen at different wavelengths that change the yeah. color that it's seen as. Is that pretty much? Yeah, okay. yeah. I'd I'd say that's a pretty good idea of it. Okay. Um, but like with uh with how color, she says you're wrong nicely. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're doing great, sweetie. <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> Um, so with color, what actually happens is light will hit something mm -hmm. and whatever it hits will actually absorb some of that light and it'll reflect back certain colors. Okay. So, so that's where the wavelength changes when it's on the way back. Yeah. Okay. And so it's, it's pretty interesting to think about because like, it, let's say we're talking about this blue right here. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see it as blue. So we say like, oh yeah, that's blue. It's everything well, but blue. It's everything but blue. Dude, can yeah. we have one podcast where you don't blow my I brain? Know, I'm sorry. What? Okay. Yeah. So is that why they say like white is all color? Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. Because uh, you always hear that like black is the absence of color and white is all color. Yeah. It's like, no, brother, it's the other way. Yeah. So white actually reflects everything and black reflects basically nothing. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you would say black is all colors and white is no colors. And they figured this out in the 1800s? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, no, it's pretty you crazy. You know what? Go you guys in the 1800s. <laughs> So 
So um, we've got our little uh, put together a, sp a spreadsheet of facts for us to take a look at. Yeah, um, I looked. I looked at it before we sat down to record, and I'm like, nah, <laughs> step back. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, so like, what I actually did is I wrote a paper on spectroscopy my senior year of college, and. Oh, okay. I um, just like copied and pasted a bunch of it into mm. this document so that we okay. could just kind of like hit some cool points on it. Legit. But um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to like go through. So um, first, when we're talking about spectroscopy, we have to address the idea of spectra. Um, so there are multiple types of spectra. Uh, technically, there are three. There's continuous absorption and emission spectra. And is that the the wavelength? So um, a spectrum is like, I like to think of them as rainbow barcodes that tell you mm. what something's made of. Okay. Um, so like, for example, an absorption spectrum would be a colorful bar, so the full rainbow, with dark lines inside of it. And those dark lines tell you what is in whatever you're looking at. Because so, it's absorbed that color. Exactly. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. This makes sense. So there'll be like a hydrogen line because that is where hydrogen um, gets absorbed, right? Um, an emission spectrum is the opposite. It is a dark bar with colorful lines showing when something is emitted. And the thing about okay. these spectra is they're they like sound pretty like intuitive and everything. But what's like process of elimination? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what's actually happening um, is we've got atoms, right? And those atoms have electrons. Oh God, we're going deep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And so those atoms have electrons, right? Okay. And electrons, um, they can be in different states. So I like to think of it as like, um, let's say you're in a building with multiple floors, right? And there's an elevator in this building and okay. the electron is in that elevator. Now the electron <laughs> lives on one <laughs> of those <laughs> floors, <laughs> <Okay>. right? <laughs> so uh, the electron, it lives on one of those floors, but it can go up, it can go down, right? The okay. way that it does that is it actually absorbs energy um, in the form of light. So like a little tiny packet of light called a photon, right? Okay. So the electron absorbs the photon <laughs> and it can jump up states. Uh, so it goes up in that elevator. Oh, it has to power its elevator car. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And so with an absorption spectrum, it actually um, is showing when the light is absorbed by the electron and then that electron jumps up states. An emission spectra shows when it goes down states. When it lets go of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see, I'm following along great. Exactly. And um, the, the thing that took me a while to like understand between these two is that they can actually be different. Because if you think about it, an electron, um, it absorbs something, it jumps up a state. It can't really absorb another thing and go back, uh, go up another one. Hmm. All it can do is go down one and then maybe go down another. And so emission spectra can actually have more lines than absorption spectra. Gotcha. So if it's an emission, it has more chance for career growth in its elevator path. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going <laughs> to <I laughs> like <guess so. laughs> hit a spot and then it's just downhill from there. Kind of, yeah. Okay. So does that mean it can only get energy at the bottom level? Um. It can only get energy, yeah, in its, like, home state is, okay. I guess, the way I would phrase that. Okay. Yeah. And, like... Um, like a baseball team. I think there's... Man. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can kind of see right here. But there's also a continuous spectrum, which is light of all different wavelengths. And so it's just, like, a rainbow bar, basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so those are like, uh, they're referring to the radiation transmitted through or radiated from a substance, right? Okay. So that's what we were talking about with like absorbing the photon or emitting the photon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know when you, so like when you observe the stars, mm -hmm. um, you get light back through the telescope mm -hmm. and that measure, like when the astronomer sits down at their laptop and they get online and they look at the light, um, it shows them how bright the light is and then from there they can use spectros I'll never be able to say that word spectroscopy spectroscopy perfect to mm -hmm. see what that light was giving back it depends okay. um so there are multiple different instruments that you can attach to a telescope it has to be a spectra. exactly okay 
Yeah. And so like um, our Lowell Discovery Telescope has the Devaney spectrograph. So if that's equipped, yes, it can. What's it called? Devaney. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, there's also like the LMI, the Large Monolithic Imager uh, mm-hmm. that's attached to the LDT. Right. And that is a basically a camera, right? right. Right. Um, and so you can't really operate both at the same time. Um, you have to like switch between the two. Okay. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So, um, it has to have a, a spectrometer? Is spectrograph. That? Spectrograph. Mm-hmm. And then that is how you can like easily measure light coming through. So it has to be a tool mounted onto your, uh, your, uh, telescope basically. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah. And like there are, um, types of instruments or ways of uh, studying just like the brightness of something. So the light coming off of it, a spectrograph analyzes that light and tells you what something is made of. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I'm on board. Yeah. And I'm there's like a bunch of different types of spectroscopy based off of the different wavelengths of light in the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Um, and so that's what I kind of wanted to go into next. Um <sighs> There's a lot. Um, there is a lot. This is the basics. Yeah. The paper I wrote was like Buckle seven up. pages long or something. Yeah. Um, so basically, we're just going to start with the longest wavelengths, which are the okay. lowest energy. And we're going to move up to okay. the smallest wavelengths, which is the highest energy. Okay. Uh, so starting with the lowest wavelengths, we've got radio spectroscopy. So uh, radio spectroscopy um, makes use of magnetic resonance to perform passive remote sensing of various materials, which like is black holes. ridiculous. Uh, Don't black holes emit radio waves? Didn't they find this out recently? Or Yes. Okay. Um, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't know. I don't know if they really use radio spectroscopy for that specifically. Oh. I don't think they do. Um, but it's mostly used in... Um, like when it comes to astronomical radio astronomy, um, it was actually discovered in 1933. So it's been around for quite a bit of time. Okay. And um, basically, uh, there was this guy named Carl Jansky, and he worked <laughs> at Bell Labs. And he was trying to find uh, the source of static coming from uh, radio transmissions, right? And <gasps> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And Flashback so, to like literally a year ago when Wesley first blew my mind when he was on. Okay. Yeah. Yes, continue. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so um, basically he um, started, he like built his own radio telescope to try and figure out what was going on. And um, he actually wrote the very first textbook for radio astronomy and we still use that textbook today. Really? Yeah. It's oh, like I'd... the most popular uh, textbook for radio astronomy. Jansky. I know, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it uh And he was trying to find out why on a radio you hear static. Like shh. Kind of, yeah. So like radio telecommunications is specifically what he was looking at. And um he could hear like nearby thunderstorms, distant thunderstorms, and a faint unknown source. And that's what he was um studying and he believed it uh was coming from the sun. But uh, it actually was not the sun. Um, it shifted from near the sun to the center of the Milky Way's galaxy. And so I think that was uh, him kind of... Can you imagine? I know, Like, right? late at night. Like, did you see... Was it First Contact? Whatever that was? Contact. Like the, contact. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just like late at night listening to this. He's like, it's I know, coming right? from... He's like, whoa. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm actually um, going to pull up... The cortisol uh, levels were like super high. Right. I'm going to pull up the paper I wrote too uh, so that we can, we've got yeah. some images to look at yeah. and we can drop those in the Discord for the right. listeners. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but our Discord's so fun, by the way. Like if you're is, not on it, you're, it is you're missing fun. out on some memes, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, so okay. he, he found out that the source of this transmission was coming from the center of the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so... Um, Basically, do do do. Oh, wow. Let me find it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) It's like an actual paper. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Um, And so, um, for context, I just want everyone to know that it's written in Times New Roman. So you can get like the vibe, like what we're going for. (laughs) This is very fancy. We can drop the paper in there too. It's not like it's a like patented thing or anything. It was just for my, um, my, whatchamacallit? Thesis? Um, what do they do? Not you? really. It was for an independent study class, oh, okay. and it was like my final paper for it. Nice. Um, but yeah, so do do do. I 
I don't think I actually wrote in here what it was he was looking at. <laughs> but nevertheless, he realized it was coming from the center of the Milky Way. Yeah. So what were the what did he extrapolate from that? Um, he just he started up this whole new realm of like radio astronomy. Um wasn't a huge thing or specifically like radio spectroscopy wasn't okay. really a huge thing until he started doing it okay. um and now it's actually used here on earth uh primarily the radio spectroscopy field has to do with mri machines gotcha yeah. gotcha yeah so not just studying space but... exactly it's most commonly used in medicine oh, okay. with these mri machines um and it's really cool i actually have some statistics here okay in 2017 there were 37.56 million mri machines in the u.s alone wow yeah and since they use radio waves, they're less harmful than X-rays and CT scans right. um, because these longer, low energy wavelengths are much less harmful to humans than, you know, smaller, Feels important. more energetic wavelengths. Right. But yeah, that's insane. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. See astronomy, good for everybody. I know, right? So yeah, um, radio spectroscopy, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, basically, okay. the main thing it's used for is MRI machines. Right. Mm -hmm. And this this radio signal, basically, before our viewers mm -hmm. freak out from the center of the Milky Way, this was just background. I think it was radiation. actually no. So that's something different. Um, let's see. It's um, I think it was coming from Sagittarius A star, but I could be Sagittarius A star. Okay, our uh, supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It's called what? The Sagittarius A star? Mm -hmm. That's its name. Okay, cute. Yeah. Um, so, Jansky radio emissions. Right. Um, I love having my laptop right here so that we can just like I know, pull this stuff just up find and this tell information from everybody. all these people exactly what's going on. That's right. <laughs> uh, center of Milky Way. Yeah, I'm just really curious like what... Um, because I'm just going to get brain worms from this if it's mm -hmm. just like, oh, yeah, he heard something coming. A radio transmission from the Ooh. center of the Milky Way. Anyway, moving on. Anyway, moving on <laughs> to the next thing, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Surprise yeah. discovery of radio waves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say. It doesn't say You know what? Get, a, get on that Discord. Go to our Discord and tell us. Yeah. Um, cause it, it, everything really just says like, yeah, anyway, so radio waves are. Yeah. They're here now. Interesting. Coming from our black hole. No big deal. All right. We're reaching out to you guys. Uh, please send us in yep. anything Let's you might Let's start find. a fight in the Discord about what those radio waves, uh, <laughs> radio transmissions it was could be. obviously aliens. Obviously. Obviously. Yes. Or that black hole is trying to send us a transmission from another through a wormhole. Mm -hmm. It's a whole mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a different episode. Yep. Coming up next. <laughs> yeah, our right. black hole episode. That's right. Um. So let's move on to okay. microwave spectroscopy. Got it. Um, so microwaves are more the next familiar step with up. these. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> microwaves are uh, one step up and um, in like energy, but right. slightly so smaller like more, wavelengths. They're they're more wiggly. Yeah, they're a little faster. Okay, mm -hmm. um, that's about where my <laughs> science like they're wiggly. Okay. <laughs> Right, gotcha. Okay. Um, so this is one that I'm not super duper familiar with because mm -hmm. it's actually mostly used in analytical chemistry. I am not okay. a chemist, so. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it can um, show like the interaction between interesting molecules. Mm -hmm. um, it agitates them, right? It's like kind of yeah. makes them mad and makes them. That's how micro. <laughs> I just know how microwaves work because that's fair. I'm very pro microwave. Oh yeah, in microwaves our are great. Um, Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's usually looked at as a, temp a function of temperature instead of frequency. Mm -hmm. right. So frequency is what I'm talking about, about being like more energetic. Um, that's in terms of frequency, but microwaves are more talked about uh, as like temperature functions. Okay. Um, but yeah, pretty much everything I was looking at was just like analytical chem. That's pretty much all it's used for. Ooh, yeah, and we can just like slide right over. Yeah, this we're is just an astronomy like podcast, <laughs> folks. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so next, of course, is infrared spectroscopy. Okay. Um, so we've talked about infrared a couple of times. Can't because Superman see an infrared? Am I making this up? I think it's x-ray. He can see an x-ray. But infrared, the James Webb Space Telescope looks in infrared. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah. Not, I, I confuse <laughs> Superman and the James Webb like literally all the They're time. They're basically the same They're thing. basically, I, that's my bad. That's my bad. That has, that's common. Okay. So James Webb um, sees in infrared. James Webb sees in infrared. the red, he's looking at the red shift. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Gotcha. And so infrared, it's actually widely used in a ton of different fields of research. So whereas mm-hmm. like microwave is mostly just one field of research, Mm -hmm. infrared's all over the place. Um, It is uh, something that I didn't know until I started writing this paper is it's actually what we use to determine blood alcohol content in potential drunk drivers. What? Yeah. Infrared spectroscopy. So like it looks at the, this is a breathalyzer, right? Pretty much. Um, I think it's slightly different actually. Or is it like a blood test? I think it's a blood test. I think this is the one where it's like if your breathalyzer isn't like super right good then you can do like the blood test to see the blood alcohol content wow okay and then um so alcohol is in redshift (laughs) (laughs) okay um it's also used in analytical and organic chemistry for quality control in industry dynamic measurement and monitoring applications um so it's like a quality control thing and Um, it's just looking at something in infrared gives you more information about what you're looking at. Kind of. It's not that it gives it gives you more information. It gives you different information. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, it has been used to identify pigments in paintings. So even in like the art history world, it's been oh, used. Oh, fun. Yeah. Okay. I like uh, that. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. This is like super versatile. I mean, like it's been used in the food industry to determine compounds found in various food products. It's also used to detect gas leaks in the transportation of natural gases and crude oils. Really? Yeah. Okay. So it's the same technology that the James Webb uses to look at things in redshift. Which Not means, necessarily right? the same technology. Just the same concept. The same wavelength. The same wavelength. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So spectroscopy and imaging are a little different. And okay. James Webb is mostly doing infrared imaging. It does have some other um, some other things on it, like different uh, instruments and stuff on it. Mm-hmm. But um, what we're talking about here is just the spectroscopy. That specific wavelength. Okay. okay. I'm on board now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Many planets and stars actually primarily emit in infrared wavelengths, and so infrared spectroscopy is very valuable in astronomical research because of planets and stars. Away. Not necessarily because they're moving away. Infrared, the way I like to think of it, is more in like a heat sense. So, like if you were to put on like heat goggles, usually that's infrared that you're looking at. So if you've seen like the like predator, predator, but, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> you saw that clip. I, I, yeah, you I knew saw it. it was predator. Okay. Um, so like he sees an infrared. Um, oh my god. Yeah, and so what a clever boy. Um, planets and stars, like uh, stars, emit a ton of heat, right? And so they they have pretty strong infrared mm-hmm. signatures. Um, planets, mm-hmm. a lot of planets also uh, emit heat or at least like reflect their starlight. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so infrared is super important awesome okay that's really cool yeah nice um so the predator could be an art history because <laughs> he can see an infrared and so he knows that we're moving on it's fine <laughs> i'm so sorry that would be hilarious that's like <laughs> yeah like a mini series or something right? about what he does when he's done hunting in his free time he's just analyzing pigments and yes. helping people find drunk drivers <laughs> Oh, yes, Van Gogh. <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. Someone picked that up. Uh, just credit star stuff. But, right. You know, go wild. <laughs> um, so before James Webb, there have been multiple infrared uh, space telescopes. I remember you talking about this. Yes. Because you're like, he's special, but mm-hmm. um, he's got – he's. He's got, like, ancestors, basically, yeah. is the way I would think He's of it. He's a big boy, but there are others. Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, the Spitzer Telescope, it was launched in 2003, mm-hmm. and it continued uh, taking infrared imaging up until January of 2020. Um, and then... What bef- happened to it? Uh, we decommissioned it because uh, James Webb was supposed to launch soon. Oh. I mean... It, it retired or... It-, it retired. Okay. Yeah. So, it's not. it's not, like... A bad thing. It's just the technology was pretty out of date by then. I mean, it had. So was it just out there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, we we decommissioned telescopes after a while because like um, telescopes, you have to like build all the parts. You have to go through. You have mm-hmm. to um, like make sure everything works. You have to start getting it ready for launch. Launch it and everything. Yeah. yeah. So by the time it launches, its technology is already out of date. 
yep. and then it's up there for I mean 2003 to 2020 that's We're industrious almost little critters 20 down years here. you yeah. know yeah, yeah, yeah. and so by then the technology is way outdated and right. so mm -hmm. we stopped using it because we were like oh James Webb is going to be sent up there um and there was actually another um Spe uh, there was another infrared telescope before Spitzer or around Spitzer. I mm. cannot for the life of me remember what it was called, but that's cool. Um, Let us know in Discord. I believe there's been three. Okay. Um, James Webb, it has a uh, NIRSPEC spec on it, uh, N I R S P E C. Uh, that is the near infrared spectrometer or spectrograph. Um, spectrograph. Okay, got it. Or spectrometer. Yeah, I was right the first time. Mm. Okay. Um, and so that is going to be studying all kinds of stuff. Um, and it is studying all kinds of stuff right now, you know, aliens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, so that's on James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. Uh, the reason that's it's cool. near infrared is because the infrared range on the electromagnetic spectrum is huge. It is one of the largest ranges of wavelengths. So it can travel very far. Not, not huge in terms of like goes far i mean like if you were to plot out the in, uh, electromagnetic spectrum and like let's say it's on a meter stick right infrared would take up like a lot of that meter stick so there are so it's just thick it's like real thick on the graph like there's a no lot so like like i think in 2d i'm sorry there's um like all of these are different wavelengths of light right okay yes it has longest range of wavelengths. I understand. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah. And so um, it's it's very, like, diverse. So we've got, mm. like, near-infrared, mid-infrared, and far-infrared. Okay. Right? And so NERSPEC is near-infrared. Got it. Okay. Um, we also had on the New Horizons mission a couple of different uh, spectrometers. Tipping. Who? <laughs> Who's that? Um, and one of them uh, that studies visible and infrared light is called Ralph, mm -hmm. which I find hilarious. Ralph, like, just Ralph. I love <laughs> His just name was Ralph. Literally, it's not a. It's not an. It's just Ralph. It's. I think it might. It might be an acronym, but I don't want to know it. I don't either. It's I just, just want it to be Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ralph. Um, and so it actually provided thermal maps. Anything of Pluto. about Pluto is wholesome. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Pluto's story mm -hmm. aside. From Mm -hmm. we'll talk about them. <laughs> it's so wholesome. Like it is. Clyde's story, the New Horizons I know. thing, the Diet Lucy. The Honestly, it's, it's fantastic. I just love the whole story arc. <laughs> anyway, um, um, yes, yes, yes. But Ralph. yeah, so Ralph, um, it provides thermal maps of Pluto as well as some other things because it, it doesn't just study in infrared. It also studies invisible light. Um, and so, because uh, visible light. or in In space. Visible. Visible. Yeah. In space. space. Visible. visible. Okay, mm -hmm. cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, hold up. <laughs> um, I mean, like, technically, to our eyes, infrared is invisible, so. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but, yeah, so that's kind of um, infrared spectroscopy in a nutshell. Um, then nice. we move on, and visible spectroscopy, we often lump it together with ultraviolet spectroscopy as well. It's called UV-vis uh, UV spectroscopy. UV-vis visible. UV is not visible. Okay. Yeah. Not to the human eye, at least. To those insects and stuff that we were talking about. Yes. We're inclusive us, for no. the moths. So, okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, so UV vis spectroscopy um, is kind of um, – it's what people would typically think of if they've heard of spectroscopy before. Um, so UV vis spectroscopy can be used for all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's used to me measure how much radiation a chemical substance absorbs. Um, so when we were talking about absorption versus emission spectra, yes, that's mostly what we're talking about with UV vis spectroscopy. Okay. And so, um, this type of spectroscopy is good in, again, analytical chemistry. They use a lot of spectroscopy in analytical chem, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it can also characterize uh, semiconductor materials, coatings, glass, liquids, and all kinds of stuff. Um, okay. So Hubble Space Telescope has two spectrographs on it. It's got the Cosmic Origins Spectrograph, or COS, uh, which does UV spectroscopy, and the Space Telescope Imaging spectra uh, Spectrograph, STITIS, I don't know how you would pronounce that, uh, which is an all-purpose hmm. spectrograph, so it handles, like, really bright objects. And UV is, like, the, the light from the sun? 
light comes from the sun? So the sun lets off pretty much all different types of radiation. Okay. UV radiation is the harmful type that makes it down to earth, that gives you sunburns, sunburns. can give you sun uh, skin cancer, right. all of that stuff. Gotcha. Um, yep. But uh, we were talking about New Horizons. New Horizons mm-hmm. actually has quite a few different instruments on it. So it's also got, uh, it's got Ralph, right? And it's mm-hmm. got Alice, which is oh. a UV spectrograph that analyzed uh, Pluto's atmosphere. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Which... Dr. Amanda Bosch at Lowell Observatory discovered existed. Shout out to Amanda Bosch. We love her. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. Also, Alice and Ralph. Really quick break from all of this. We got new mugs. Oh my God, noticed. that's right. <laughs> They're very fancy. Yes. Neither of us are left handed, but we're making it work because it's a nonprofit. I'm actually ambidextrous. Are you really? Mm-hmm. Of course you are. Shocked. <laughs> that's there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I just want to. And if you're make listening on Spotify, you should run to YouTube to true. check them out. That's true. I want to make it known that our cameraman almost just laughed out loud. He I did. saw him covering his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so all right, cool. uh, we talked about UV vis. Um, now we're moving on to X-ray spectroscopy. Superman. So, um, yeah, Superman. Okay, we're here. <laughs> so um, UV through gamma rays, these are harmful to humans uh, because their wavelengths are so small. They're so energetic. So um, ultraviolet light can give you sunburns, skin cancer, things like that. Yep. X-ray radiation, a lot of people are really nervous about getting X-rays and stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're getting like an X-ray or a few X-rays a year, you're totally fine. But you'll notice that the doctors who are giving you the x-rays, they'll actually leave the room when they give x-rays. And that's because right. that is their job. They do it multiple times a day, multiple times a week. Mm-hmm. That much x-ray radiation can harm you. Okay. And so uh, for anyone who's like worried about x-ray radiation and all of that, a little bit won't harm you. A lot of it will. That's like a rule for so many things in I life. know, right? <laughs> Honestly. Okay. Gotcha. Um. And so X-ray spectroscopy, um, it is the primary method used by astronomers to study things like supernova remnants, black holes, and other astronomical events that are extremely hot. So... Is a black hole hot? Black holes are actually freezing cold, um, but they emit stuff and that is warm. cold? Mm -hmm. Wait. (laughs) So they're freezing cold, but they emit heat. Kind of. We'll we'll go over this in the black hole episode. Okay, well, let's save it for that. Let's um, save it for that. Yeah, because that's like I'm a not ready. Whole episode. On I haven't its had own. enough coffee. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So, um, like, there's a picture. So when we got the very first ever picture of a black hole, it was that circle that we saw. Right. Um, I'm sure you've seen the picture. The one that we um, used in the cat meme. Yes. That we put on Discord. Exactly. Okay. I'm on board. There was another picture that came out with it where there was like a bunch of material coming off of it. Like it looked super chaotic and crazy. That was an x-ray. Um, so x-ray shows us different things than visible light or uh, infrared, whatever. Okay. Um, and so Chandra is actually NASA's x-ray space telescope located in space, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it can better define hot, turbulent regions of space. So uh, really hot things give off some pretty decent X-ray signatures. Okay. And so uh, we typically study them in X-ray light. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the last of the electromagnetic spectroscopies uh, is gamma ray spectroscopy. Mm-hmm. Gamma rays are, of course, what Bruce Banner was shot with to become the Hulk. Yes, that's the first <laughs> thought I had. <laughs> that's what I always tell people because yeah. that's the first thing people think of. They're like, wait a second, I've heard of gamma rays before. Yeah. That's why. This is why. Um, and so gamma uh, ray spectroscopy, um, it is really good at identifying and mapping radioactive materials. Um, It is very, very teeny tiny wavelengths. Um, They're very, very energetic. And so uh, it works best with uh, talking about radioactive materials. Um, Radioactive decay is seen in many situations. um, And so it uh, like usually when we're talking about radioactive decay and radioactive materials and stuff, a lot of times people will be talking about like uranium, right? That's a really big Mm -hmm. radioactive material that gets talked about. Uh, Plutonium, things like that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Pluto. Um, Pluto. Not so wholesome right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Um, So that's kind of what gamma ray spectroscopy is typically used for. Gotcha. Now those are all based off of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. There are actually two other types of spectroscopy that are not based off of light necessarily. So there is particle spectroscopy and acoustic spectroscopy. So these are gonna be slightly different. Um, There are a couple of different types of particle spectroscopy. 
And um, some of them use like solar wind, uh, plasma uh, spectrometers. Uh, both of those are actually on New Horizons. So New Horizons had like a ton of spectrometers. There was Alice, Ralph. There's a whole transformer up there. I know, right? There's okay. also Swap and Pepsi. Um, oh my gosh. I just want to know the person <laughs> in charge of naming I know, all right? of this stuff on New Horizons. It's so good. They're adorable. It's so I good. But their dad jokes are on point. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Pepsi. But these typically use ions and electrons instead of photons. Which we can't see. Exactly. Yeah, they're teeny tiny little Itty dudes. Okay. Itty bitty dabies. Um, okay. And so uh, there's like different types, like single particle spectroscopy, charged particle spectroscopy, magnetic particle spectroscopy, a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. I didn't go super into detail with this because it's not as common as other things in most fields. Okay. But in very specialized fields, they like only use particle spectroscopy. So, so. all of this, the people who study particle spectroscopy right now listening are real mad. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, next particle. It's okay. It's okay. Anyway. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so uh, it learns about like the composition, density, flow, velocity of uh, the temperature of like the planets. Planets, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's something this can be used for. Then acoustic spectroscopy um, is <laughs> really weird because it is um, talking about like sound, basically. Yeah. Okay. So when I said I studied optics, what I actually did is I uh, worked in a photonics lab. Photonics uh, is the interaction of light and sound. So are you ready for your mind to be absolutely blown? So you know how there's okay. photons, which are little packets of light? Mm-hmm. There are also phonons, which are little packets of sound. And phonons exist in everything. So it like, sounds made up, Haley. I, it sounds so made up. I, I know, I know. <laughs> but like phonons. Phonons. I'm I'm dead serious. Like okay. um, so if you were to like knock on a table and it makes that knocking sound, right? What you're doing is you're ex exciting the phonons inside of the table. It's super weird. And then they <laughs> Squiggle up to your ears. They make the noise. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, sound pocket, sound packets, sound packets, it's like hot pockets, but but sound loud. Okay. <laughs> um, and so these uh, they use a visible representation of the spectrum of frequencies as a signal or function of time. Uh, it's called a spectrogram. Can you what? Yeah. So why did time get snuck in there? <laughs> What's time doing everywhere? I know. Time honestly. needs to have a drink of water and sit down. Time needs to it chill. Just needs to touch some grass <laughs> because it's everywhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> what? Touch some grass. Touch needs, needs to go touch some grass. Honestly. What is it doing in sound? Um, so it's just like really weird. I would have to like show you the math equations and you Can don't want that. Can that be our description for every podcast? It's, it's just, just really, really weird. weird. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, so t where was this? So acoustic spectroscopy is used in like fields of music, linguistics, sonar, radio, uh, radar, speech processing, seismology, and other things like that. So like they can be uh, used to identify spoken words phonetically and analyze the calls of various animals. So basically it's studying sound instead of light. Okay. Yeah. All the different... I just, I think in squiggly lines, all the different wavelengths of, that sounds produce that get back to our ears. Yeah, and uh, sound waves are slower than light waves, right? Everything is slower than light right. waves. Right, like light if you're down a hallway, fastest thing. you can even get a, like a delay. Exactly, okay. yeah. Whereas light, if you're just down a hallway, you're going to see it immediately, Be right? Fast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, okay, so yeah, that's acoustic spectroscopy. Okay. We're going to breeze um, Again, I didn't thing. get super in-depth into it because it is... Well, it's not astronomy. Yeah, exactly. It's not astronomy, um, but it is really cool. It is yeah. really interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah. That's... Now, <laughs> yeah. So that's like <laughs> the knew? rundown of the different types of spectroscopy. Okay. Um, I have some extra facts oh, about we spectroscopy love, as well. We love the some fun, fun Haley facts. facts. Yes. Fun facts. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, spectroscopy has played an important role in many of man's greatest accomplishments. And women. And women's. Uh, but mostly. they didn't get any they didn't credit. Get the credit. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Mankind. <laughs> so um, 
I've just got a couple of examples here. Like okay. in 1802, W.H. Wollaston demonstrated the significance of using a narrow slit in lieu of a pinhole or round aperture to image different color or wavelengths. Um, what? So <laughs> um, he was basically just showing that like slits are better to study this kind of stuff than just like poking a hole in something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a little weird. It's a little weird. Um, then um, Joseph, Fra- Joseph Fraunhofer in 1814 uh, like replicated that, that. I know, right? Um, and he was actually the first to observe stellar spectra. So oh. star spectra. Okay. Um, and We like him. I know, right? It's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so he got the first accurate measurements of wavelengths of the dark lines in the solar spectrum. Okay. Yeah. Then in 1859, um, the origins of the dark lines in the sun spectrum that Fraunhofer saw mm-hmm. were accounted for by G.R. Kirchhoff, I think is how you pronounce his name. Kirchhoff. Um, and basically he figured out like, oh, it's the absorption by the elements uh, that are oh in the cooler uh, sun's atmosphere. And right? I totally understand that because I listened to the first half of this episode. Exactly. Wow, <laughs> I learned so much. Okay. Um. And then in 1861, uh, Kirchhoff with R. Bunsen used spectroscopy Bunsen? to discover Bunsen. Like Bunsen burner Bunsen? Probably. Of the Bunsen burner fame family? More, more than likely. I don't yeah, know. Okay. <laughs> Who's to say, man? These guys are everywhere. I know, right? <laughs> but um, they actually used spectroscopy to discover two new alkali metals. That sounds like Bunsen burner family. It sounds like Bunsen burner family. I, I have I suspicions. Know. Okay. But it was uh, cesium and rubidium that they discovered. Rubidium. Rubidium. That sounds like a Star Trek word. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> you keep going. I'm going to look that up. Rubidium. Um, in 1910, the adoption of the first international standards of wavelengths happened. Um, and uh, basically these standards, uh, along with a uh, couple of things – implemented later um they made it that sounded like kermit oh my gosh later (laughs) Later. (laughs) um anyway uh they made it possible to measure wavelengths of all electromagnetic radiation with newfound accuracy and then of course my favorite fun fact vesto melvin slifer Uh, vesto vesto melvin slifer used spectroscopy in order to obtain the first evidence that the universe was expanding back in 1913 so um, basically, he used the Clark telescope along with a spectrograph that he put on it. And he put a spectrograph on the Clark? Uh huh. Yeah, the spectrograph oh, I didn't know that's that. in the collection center. The one that was purchased because yes. we broke the other telescope. That's my favorite that's story such ever. That's a fun story. It's we literally, like, so. Set spark notes for him. I know. I know right? we're running out of time, but I, I, it fits. So for our viewers, uh, basically. We um, broke this telescope. We broke something. <laughs> and uh, basically, like one of the astronomers asked his assistant to go get the good alcohol, but he thought he said wood alcohol. So we brought wood alcohol, trashed the telescope. Oof. Being Percival, an intern's hard. I know, right? So stressful. So Percival Lowell, um, he was like, okay, I'm going to purchase this telescope as well as your most expensive piece of equipment, which was the spectrograph. As a sorry. Exactly, as a sorry. Which is sweet. Um, as well as the most expensive piece of equipment, the spectrograph. Um, but the thing was, nobody at Lowell Observatory did spectroscopy, so nobody knew <laughs> um, how to use this thing. Mm. Uh, but at Lick Observatory, there were people who knew how to use this instrument. But... Lick Observatory and Lowell Observatory had this rivalry because Lick Observatory's director came out and called Percival Lowell crazy. Mm-hmm. And so... The whole Martians thing. It's the whole it's thing. It's the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Which, look, who's laughing now? <laughs> as we're on the Mars rover looking for organic mm-hmm. fossils. Honestly. Just saying. Just saying. Um, but... At us, like. Vesto Slifer reached kidding, out to Percival. <laughs> Vesto Slifer reached out, reached out to Percival and was like, hey, can I go to Lake Observatory and um, like figure out how to use the spectrograph? Percival said no. Oh. <laughs> so Vesto Slifer had to learn they how to use me. this thing on his own. Oh, and okay. he actually came up with a method of using it that nobody else really used. Okay. And it worked better than the old methods of using them. Nice. So he uh, figured out 
that uh, galaxies were moving further and further away from us. And uh, Edwin Hubble took this information, ran with it, and proved the theory of the expanding universe. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just a fun little tidbit there. Well, you break tidbit. something, you make it up as you go along, <laughs> you might discover something crazy. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> and for the record, we are friends with Lick again. Yeah. We love Lick. Honestly. We yeah. love all of them. We're yeah. all friends. We're all buddies. We have a, we have a secret group chat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we should. I know, right? I mean, we do. That would be cool. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but one of my favorite facts that I read about is the European Southern Observatory stated that if there's life on other planets, it's going to be found with spectroscopy. <gasps> yeah. Ooh. So if there are aliens out there, that's how we're going to find them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're then, waiting on our radio signal. Right. From, uh, <laughs> years and years ago. hmm um, so I have my final fun fact. Are you ready? A paper was published in the Journal of Molecular Structure implying that spectroscopic advances in the near future could induce the use of bioharmonic resonances to diagnose and treat psychosomatic disorders. What? Yeah. Really? The paper also suggested that the development of prosthetic sensors due to uh, future advances may occur. Wow. Yeah. So spectroscopy really cool. in the future could help out majorly in the medical field. You can't, you surprised me with that one. Like I was listening, but then I was trying to picture like I was trying to visualize the person who has a subscription to the Journal of Molecular <laughs> Structure and I got a little distracted, but... That's nuts. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, spectroscopic, uh, spectroscopic advances in the near future mm. could help uh, diagnose and treat psychosomatic disorders. There you go. It's crazy. I'm just going to think, thank you, astronomy. <laughs> Thanks, thank <you>. astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I think we are all out of time. We are, yeah. but that was fun. That was a, that was a wild ride that you just took. Us Honestly, on. and like I, like and I can I, tell you know more, but you're just like <laughs> we have a time limit. I know. I studied a lot of spectroscopy in college, and like I really enjoy it and everything. Mm. But by no means am I an expert. So like, right. if I said anything wrong in this episode, and Let you want to call me out, please um actually at me. Yeah, you know? we're on Discord. Honestly, way too often. Oh, way very too much. Often. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, to all our Fantastic. listeners out there, I would like to remind you for the billionth time this episode, we've got a Discord channel. Please, please join. Did you know we have a Discord channel, Did by you, the way? We have a Discord. <laughs> Discord. You know? Weird. Uh, I don't know. Um, but we also have a Twitter uh, where you can see some cool behind the yes. scenes content. We also tweet. Um, I don't post super duper often because we've only got like 40 followers or something like that. But if we yeah. get more, we're I not, will. We're not great on Twitter. It's yeah. fine. I don't know. <laughs> it's for celebrities. And, Honestly. But which yeah. we should be really good I on know, it then. right? Come celebrities. on. Come on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you can um, shoot us a question in the Discord channel, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Uh, use the hashtag, hashtag AskStarStuff to ask us any questions that you might have about life, the universe, and everything. And thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Bye. Bye. This podcast was made possible by our members and donors. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our nonprofit in making more digital education like this available, go to lowell.edu slash donate. Thanks for listening.